Welcome. Welcome, and uh, for folks just coming in, we want to encourage you to come on up toward the front, and uh, um, to the extent you feel comfortable, COVID-wise, uh, fill in and join a table with others. Uh, there will be aspects of what we spend this next 70 minutes doing that will be conversational. Um, and, uh, uh, and so don't sit by yourself and don't hang in the back. Uh, come on up. Well, welcome, everybody. I am so glad to uh, see you all today and to be back uh, together here in Aspen. My name is Eric Liu. Uh, I am the co-founder and CEO of Citizen University, uh, a nonprofit organization based in Seattle doing work all around the United States that I'll tell you a little bit about. And I also direct a program at the Aspen Institute on citizenship and American identity. And uh, as you can hear from all that use in the first minute or so of the word citizen, we think about citizenship uh, in this moment uh, a particular way. Um, and it is, I think, worth naming because a lot of what circumstances are forcing us to do right now as a people uh, and what this session is intended to help us do um, as, as folks gather together in fellowship today is to return to first principles and to kind of get down beneath some of the language and some of the words that we just use increasingly unthinkingly. Uh, and one of those words is citizenship. In our work at Citizen University, we think about citizenship um, oftentimes in this simple equation, uh, which goes like this, power plus character equals citizenship. That to live like a citizen, and I don't mean to have documentation status, to have the right passport or papers, I mean to be a member of the body, to be a contributor to community and a participant in the life of the whole, requires both a fluency in power, a literacy in what power is, who has power, who does not have it, why that is, how that came to be, how that can be changed, what sources and forms power is expressed in, in the life of a community. And then to be able to couple that literacy and power with a grounding in what we think of as civic character, by which I don't mean just individual virtue, I don't mean just grit or resilience or honesty or perseverance, all of which are great things, but we mean character in the collective, how shall we live together? What are the values and norms and habits of the heart, as Alexis de Tocqueville put it, that enable us to sustain a diverse, sometimes divided community? And the cultivation of that side of the equation, the cultivation of character, is partly about values and norms and the settings in which we uh, invite each other to uh, cultivate values and norms. But it's also just about the ways in which everyday choices add up to a culture. And I think one of the underlying ideas behind our work that undergirds the session that we're doing today is that culture matters. In some ways, culture matters foundationally. A lot of the debate right now about democracy uh, is about policy. It's about structural change. It's about the perversion of the Electoral College. It's about the fact that the Supreme Court is stacked a certain way uh, and the filibuster uh, and the Senate are stacked a certain way that give us the court, that give us the decisions that we've gotten in the, in the last few days. And a lot of our focus is on these questions of structure and policy. And absolutely, those are of central importance. But, slash, and, our view is that culture, by which I mean the values, the norms, the narratives, the habits, the mindsets, the heart sets that add up to how we imagine ourselves to be a we, that culture precedes structure. That culture is upstream of policy. That culture creates the frame and the parameters of the possible when it comes to structural change. And so I really want to begin with that note because culture is not a thing that happens to us. Culture is kind of like traffic, right? Next time you're in a traffic jam on some congested highway, remember, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. <laughs> And we're not stuck in a culture right now of division, dehumanization, polarization, short-term thinking, cynicism, and so forth. We are that culture, either by acts of omission or commission. And that responsibility taking in the formation of the civic culture uh, uh, runs across so many different realms of how we live together, but particularly in this realm of how we imagine ourselves to be a people. And that brings me to the topic at hand today. Uh, one of the things that these times have underscored for us uh, is that in a nation as diverse and centrifugal as ours, in a society as now polarized and tribally divided 
as ours right now, the need to have some common bond, some base of common knowledge, becomes ever more central. And the more divided we become, the more difficult it becomes to hold that center of common knowledge, but also the more we realize how central that is and how important it is. And what I wanted to do today in our session, how we're gonna spend this time today, is I wanna spend a little bit of time describing an initiative that we both at Citizen University and my program here at the Aspen Institute have undertaken to reawaken people to what we actually have and hold in common as a matter of knowledge and as a matter of spirit. Uh, and then we're gonna spend some time actually, uh, you know, for those of you who came to the session thinking, oh, you know, the, se the session was framed as a question, what should every American know? And for those of you who came thinking, oh, I'm gonna get the answer here today, uh, perhaps you will, but the answer will not come from me. The answer will come from us. We're gonna spend time talking about what it is and in a structured way, what each of us brings to the table, literally, in our sense of what is the knowledge, the history, the sense of identity and place and peoplehood that we as Americans should actually uh, either sustain or bring to the fore. Uh, and then we'll have time for conversation both at your tables and as a full group. Um, and we'll continue from there uh, to talk specifically about some ways in which, as a matter of skill, each of us can take a little bit of what we learn and play with and practice today back to where you're coming from back to your communities, back to your schools, back to your workplaces, families, and faith organizations. So that's the arc of our time together today. And let me start again by giving a, a bit of history of this project here that we've done. So 1987, a guy named E.D. Hirsch, uh, at the time a professor of English at the University of Virginia, wrote a book that became a kind of a surprise bestseller. It was called Cultural Literacy. And he was an expert on reading, on the kind of background knowledge that is necessary for people to gain literacy, right? So if you open up any article in any day's news uh, and you read an article about Roe v. Wade or about uh, Plessy versus Ferguson and how uh, Justice Alito in this most recent Dobbs decision uh, talked about, yeah, precedent matters, but some precedents are bad like Plessy versus Ferguson and sometimes you have to overturn precedent as the court did in Brown versus Board of Education, and that's what we're doing here in overturning Roe versus Wade, right? Just to read a sentence like that, you think about everybody in this room pretty much knows what that sentence meant. Think about the years, the many angles of entry of the formation of background knowledge that it took for you to understand what that sentence meant, for you to understand how the court works, for you to understand what Plessy versus Ferguson was to understand the implied doctrine of separate but equal, that the idea that separate but equal could be aligned with somehow the equal protection of the laws that the 14th Amendment promised us, right? That there's so much background knowledge and literacy in even reading one sentence from one day's article in the newspaper. And what E.D. Hirsch said in this book was that one of the failures of our education system, and this was you know, a generation ago, and it's only been compounded since then, uh, was that there's, there's been this right-left uh, conspiracy, in a sense, or collusion, to de-emphasize the core formation of core knowledge. That people in our schools no longer know, if I say the party of Lincoln, what the party of Lincoln was. That people today, not just students, but adults, if I say that, you know, 170 years after Appomattox, our house still remains divided. That not everybody knows what Appomattox is, and not everybody knows the allusion to a house divided, right? And that these kinds of references and historical facts and allusions make up that sense of commonality, make up that sense of a history, not that we necessarily celebrate altogether. We may contest the good, the bad, and the ugly of that history, but at least we know what we're talking about, right? And what made this book in 1987 a surprise bestseller, because it was kind of an academic treatise on how people form background knowledge and how kids need to be intentionally exposed to a big pile of facts and a big pile of these historical references and cultural allusions in order for them to be able to navigate the language of power in the world. Not just be able to read a textbook or read the newspaper, but to, be not, to not feel like they are cut out of a conversation. If people make a reference and they feel like, oh, I don't know what that's about, I guess this isn't for me. 
I don't know what they're talking about when they talk about Cesar Chavez. I don't know what the John Birch Society is. I don't know who the know-nothings were. So I feel like I don't know nothing, and I'm going to step out of this conversation, right? And what made his book a surprise bestseller was he had an appendix at the end of 5,000 items, 5,000 things that E.D. Hirsch, professor at UVA, said every American should know, right? And this was at basically the start of what we now think of as our never-ending culture wars, right? When the country was beginning to debate, to debate should our schools, should our cultural institutions promote an idea of the United States as derived from a Western tradition, an Anglo tradition of institutions and rule of law and this history of people uh, governing themselves, or should we embrace a form of multiculturalism that actually sees the contributions of different communities of color uh, and different other marginalized communities in our history? And that round of the culture wars was the context in which this list of 5,000 things landed. And this list became itself catnip to the media because everybody wanted to argue about what should every American know. And in that debate, E.D. Hirsch, a lifelong Democrat, someone who had kind of progressive intentions, uh, who in his book quoted uh, chapter and verse, the opening platform of the Black Panther Party, to point out that the Black Panther Party's platform was word for word taken from the Declaration of Independence. That the, Black, that the Black Panthers were fully literate in the, in the inheritance of American identity and use that language to hold up as a mirror, a charge, and a challenge to the society to say, you haven't lived up to this, and we're going to actually invest this with meaning in the spirit of our work, in the spirit of our organizing. Right? E.D. Hirsch was trying to make this point in the spirit of inclusion of more people into the language of power, but because this was round one of the culture wars, he got lumped in with the Western Civ Eurocentrist dead white men defenders in that debate. And so a few years ago, I wrote a piece for The Atlantic that said, you know, a generation later, let's revisit that whole controversy. Because the fact is, our country has only become more diverse, only more divided, only more fragmented, only more centrifugal. And in many ways, E.D. Hirsch was profoundly prophetic that we need to have some base of common knowledge. But where he was perhaps wrong, was in two ways. Number one, that that base of common knowledge should not be one smart dude's recitation of 5,000 things telling us from the mountaintop what we all need to know and learn, but rather that it should be something that all of us create, that all of us collectively from our knowledge, from our history, from the backgrounds that we have, from our family traditions, bring into essentially a crowdsourced collective networked intelligence of what every American should know. And that, that would get us to the second shortcoming of his list, which it was heavy on dead white men. It was very focused on the Anglo inheritance. And the fact is that it's not just that we become diverse today, but that we've been diverse from the very beginning, that the formation of the Declaration was influenced by the practices of native tribes, that the ways in which liberty and liberation have been given life and given meaning was from the very beginning from the acts and deeds and aspirations of people enslaved and people seeking liberation from enslavement. And that those stories are not just a thing tacked on today now that people of color are raising their hand and saying, I want a seat at the table, but they were present from the beginning. And so that piece for the Atlantic generated a huge amount of interest and out of that we created a very simple project. What if we asked everybody to think about this question, what should every American know? but not invite people to come up with their own list of 5,000 items, but you know, make it manageable. What are 10 things? What's a top 10 list that you would put together? From where you sit in the world, from the way you were raised, from where you are in the country, and you look around at our national conversation, you look around even at the conversations at your family gatherings, at Thanksgiving, you realize, man, people don't know what they don't know. More people should know about this stuff. If you were to make a list of 10 things, what would be on that list? And I'll tell you, when I wrote this piece several years ago, I made a list, which I, I will share with you what was on that list 10 years ago, be, uh, five years ago, because it's kind of an interesting window into how much our country has changed. Back then, I primed the pump with my own list of 10, and it was this. Number one, whiteness. Number two, the Federalist Papers. Number three, 
the almighty dollar. Number four, nativism. Number five, the American dream. Number six, the Reagan revolution. Number seven, DARPA. Who here knows what DARPA is? Yeah, all right, some folks know. We're not gonna tell the answer because it'll come back later. Um, another one was a sucker born every minute. Is that W.C. Fields? P.T. Barnum, right? Sucker born every minute. And a few other items on that list. And as I reflected on that list 10 years ago, the reason why I made a list of 10 was we created a website where we invited people from all around the United States to submit their own top 10 lists. And ra ra rather rapidly, people began to put in their top 10 lists. And we created this crowdsourced living document online that captures in a moment and over time what people think other Americans should know. And during these years, these years of upheaval, populist upheaval from both the left and the right, these years of racial reckoning, born of police killings and other tragedies and things laid bare that didn't happen for the first time but are getting known to most Americans for the first time. These years, of course, of pandemic, these years of tribalism, these years of Trumpism. And during these years, people have been putting in over and over their top 10 lists, and you get this kind of moving, changing Vorschach test, this moving, changing image of the American mind and psyche and the American yearning for what they wished others would yearn uh, others would yearn to learn. And what we've done, in addition to that simple website, is perhaps more important, and in the spirit of what we're going to do a little bit of in a moment here today, is we've used this format of a top 10 list as an invitation. And I think what's gotten worse in the years since I wrote this piece and since we launched this program is, of course, the tribalization, is, of course, what, you know, those of you who were in the session this morning with my friend Barb Walter and Yasha Munk, um, about can the United States stay united? Are we on the brink of civil war, however you might define civil war? Uh, those of you who are attending other sessions today on democracy and the breakdown of trust and the breakdown of a common sense of purpose know that it's only gotten harder just in the last 24 months to see each other. I'm not even talking about to have a conversation, to see each other. Every impulse in our lives right now is to turn three-dimensional people into two-dimensional caricatures. Every incentive on social media, every incentive that what Amanda Ripley calls conflict entrepreneurs are seizing upon on social media, in politics, in organizing, in creating moments of visible, viral, memeable fights is about making us get to that instant form of judgment. Oh, I see you. I know, what, I know what clothes you're wearing. I see how you wear your hair. I see your skin color. I see how you're dressed. I got you figured out. I know you. I got a box to put you in. That's a deep American habit, right? <laughs> but it has been weaponized and uh, it has been weaponized in our times. And so the spirit of invitation that became so important even when we started this project and now becomes vitally important is to use this top 10 list, the simple conceit as a sideways way into getting people to see one another again. If you hold a conversation in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your faith organization, my new friend Chip here leads a 5,000 person congregation in Charlotte uh, that has Republicans and Democrats in it. And they don't just gather to worship, they don't gather only to talk about issues of spirit and issues of scripture. They gather to ask themselves, what are our responsibilities as citizens? And when they gather like that, the hardest thing to do right now is to curate controversy, as Kate Levin, uh, some of you know, has put it. To curate controversy. How do we actually hold a space where people who come in with pluralistic, divergent, different worldviews? And I don't just mean, oh, I'm a blue voter and you're a red voter. I mean, oh, I'm a person of color with socially conservative views, with economically liberal points of view, with who grew up in a small rural town, who you know, votes this way on that, but believes this way on that, who has friends who are uh, uh, transgender, but who also thinks this way about bathroom issues, whatever it might be, who contains multitudes, right? And as Whitman reminded us, every one of us contains those multitudes. And so 
It's way easier in these times right now to have the invitation of something like the top 10 list to, in a non-threatening, non-defensive, non-explosive way to ask people, who are you? How are you seeing the world? What matters to you? What do you think others should know? That's a far more constructive way than to invite people into that space, into your congregation or your classroom or your work and say, hi, let's talk about red-blue divides. Let's talk about, are we on the brink of civil war right now? That's a great conversation for the Ideas Festival. That's a hard conversation to have at your community group, in your public library. And one of the things that we are doing right now with this simple format is working with a range of institutions, public libraries, college campuses, journalistic institutions, foundations, to basically decentralize this inquiry and take the top 10 format as a way to open up new conversations about who we are. And the reason we're doing that is not just that it's a sideways way um, into these hard conversations and a, and a more kind of deft way of curating controversy, but rather it's another way of three-dimensionalizing us again as people and returning to the fore the centrality of relationship. And so I'm gonna say a little bit more about that and about where that work takes us, but what I want to do right now is to give you each about five minutes silently. You see on your tables there, I hope everybody has uh, a two-sided sheet of paper that describes, and on the front side, it tells you a little bit of what I just said about this program, and it gives you three sample lists that a few of our luminary friends, Henry Louis Gates of PBS and Harvard. If you don't have one in your table, raise your hand. We've got people to, uh, to pass, uh, pass those out. Um, there's a hand right there. Um, you see a couple of sample lists that people have had, and, and you know, uh, as my friend Jane Wales was saying, you know, people who are educated, who are involved in the world, who know stuff, some of us don't know some of the things on these lists. There's not only no shame in that, there's a wonderful benefit in that. That is the seeing of other people's lists and how a playwright like David Henry Huang, who's a pioneer not just in Asian American arts, but in American arts and letters, sees things. There's an interesting question of how Anne Marie Slaughter comes to these questions of holding American identity through her work at New America, right? But I want you to kind of take a look at those lists and then on the back side of that are 10 blank lines. And I want you to think about for five minutes right now, what are 10 things you think every American should know? And they can be anything. They don't have to be history books, civic stuff. It could be something from pop culture. It could be things that you think about, well, people who are unlike me, older than me, browner than me, more conservative than me, whatever, should know, but they don't know about me, or they don't know about American life, or they don't know about our shared life in history, right? So for five minutes here, think about that, uh, and then we'll come back in just a moment.
got another minute or two. When we think intergenerationally, when we think cross-class, cross-race, cross-region, when we think about people who have identities different from our own, when we think about how limited our memories are as Americans, think about something that you've learned recently that you're like, man, why is it that, how is it that only at age, whatever it is, I'm learning about this, either part of our history or part of what's going on in our life right now as a country. And those of you who've just come in at the back and have just entered, I want to invite you to come up, uh, join one of the tables here. Um, someone at the table will explain to you really quickly what, you're, what we're doing um, and participate, because this is going to be something that uh, um, we're going to answer some of these questions together. So come on up if you want to. OK, it looks like most of you have gotten most of your lines filled in. And this is, you know, this is not school. You're not getting graded. This is not a thing where we're all trying to impress each other. Uh, in fact, the very spirit of how we've been doing this around the country, um, Chicago Public Schools has embedded this format into the way they teach civics and social studies at the high school level. Uh, public libraries from Los Angeles to New York to uh, Denver and Adams County, Colorado, and uh, other places in the United States have embedded it in the way that they form kind of public events and gatherings to get people to know each other in a community. Um, the spirit of it is a spirit of curiosity, right? And it's in that spirit of curiosity, which indeed is one of the civic virtues, one of the dimensions of civic character that has gotten obliterated during our times of righteous certitude, this time of flattening each other into, I know who you are, I know what you're about, uh, and don't you dare challenge me and my worldview because as a blank, I feel that so on and so forth, right? This whole exercise and our whole gathering is in the spirit of curiosity, humility, and open-hearted learning. And so what I want to invite us to do right now, actually, um, is uh, spend the next 10 or 15 minutes, uh, uh, actually, at your tables, sharing your lists with each other, um, and talking in turn. Introduce yourself. Say where you're from. Uh, describe what's on your list. Uh, make sure everybody gets a turn to say what's on their list, and then start having a conversation about those lists and what was interesting or what you didn't know about. Uh, and we'll come back, and I'll call us back in plenary for some conversation in about 12, 14 minutes. <clears throat> I think we're, we're good. This is it's nice. Yeah, people are, uh, it, it was really great to kind of see people's eyes as they were filling their list and just how seriously they're taking it, you know. <clears throat> Did you make a list? <laughs> okay, go fill one out. <laughs> If you're just coming in, yes, please come on in and join a table, and your table mates will fill you in. Did you make a list? Go, go join a table. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. Totally. <clears throat> There's one right behind. Actually, these, these two have a. <laughs> Tell me what you put on there. 
Uh, that's great. It totally applies. Okay. So when you, why did you put uh, the recession on there? What, what about that? Yes. Yes. I love that. Th that. So let me pause two things. Number number one, when you said just a moment ago, I don't have the confidence to do that, whatever, like really, like let go of that. I'm serious. Like, I mean, seriously, everybody, the whole spirit of this exercise is everybody, wherever they're coming from, has knowledge to share or questions to share, right? But that's the thing, right? You have, like, you may, if I were to ask you to give me a lecture on the roots of the 2008 housing crisis, financial crisis, maybe you couldn't do that. But you want to know, and you want people to learn from that, right? So number one, that, and number two, like, so you, you work for Aspen? You work for the institute? Um, I'm a summer teacher, I go to Grand Central. Okay, beautiful. So part of the education that you're getting right now um, is to assume that you're learning a language of power, right? Get comfortable speaking it, get comfortable using it, get comfortable claiming it, okay? So even a conversation about, like, you know, I don't know if these things are good on the list. I don't know. Like, don't undercut yourself when you start. Like, these are great items to have on a list, right? And every, like, in five years, like, people will be like, we should have talked more about American exceptionalism. We never, you know, it's a term, and people have opinions on it, but we never actually unpacked as a country, like, you know, the good and the bad parts of that legacy, right? We never learn from this in a full way, and now the next bubble's gonna come, and the next thing's gonna come, right? So um, I love this stuff. This is, uh, um, yeah, seriously, keep, keep kind of in inhabit that, okay? Yeah, what are you studying? Okay, so Hari Han is a dear friend of mine who leads the um, SNF Agora um, Institute at Hopkins. Um, which is the institute that does kind of civic learning and civic w research on civic life and civic practice. Um, go look her up. Go look up the, the program and the project. Um, Hari is H-A-H-R-I-E. Yep. Um, and uh, Han, H-A-N. Look her up. Get involved with that because someone like you who's already interning here and curious about this stuff should totally be plugging in, plugging in there. Tell me your first name again. Valentina. Valentina. Okay. I, you know, som sometimes the simplest indications open up the deepest stuff, you know? And that's the, uh, uh, I love that you both have full list of things. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's a beautiful thing to see. This is a beautiful thing to see as you're all doing this. <clears throat> w way to go. <laughs>
Well, about three more minutes of uh, three more minutes of table conversation. We'll come back in plenary. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And they didn't coordinate. These were just people. Yeah, you know. And that's the thing about a. Yeah. To have stone wall and the. the, the If you're coming in just now, join a table. Come on in and join a table, and you'll quickly get the drift of what we're doing. OK, about one more minute of table conversation. Okay, let's come back to the full room conversation. It has been, I must tell you, it's been thrilling. It has been thrilling to meander and weave among your tables and to get little slices of your conversations and your learning from one another. Um, and we, I wanna hold a room-wide conversation for a stretch of time here right now and begin with a question of, tell us something that you just learned or something that was interesting that you heard in someone else's list uh, right now. Uh, and we've got a couple of folks with mics, so we've got a hand here um, and a mic coming your way. And tell us who you are and where in the country or the world you call home, and, uh, and then tell us what struck you from your colleagues' list. Hi, I'm Lisa from Los Angeles, California. Um, my friend, my new friend Olivia, uh, cited a podcast, an episode of Radio Lab about the history of American football. Hmm. and how Pop Warner started American football using mostly, or working mostly with Native Americans. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And who, who put that on the list? Okay, tell us why you put that on the list. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, tell, tell us your name, too. My name is Olivia Pevic. Um, I'm from Carbondale, Colorado, just down the road. Um, uh, I learn everything uh, from podcasts, and Radio Lab is a great one. And um, uh, it was something I didn't know. The first time a football was ever passed in a game was um, between a Native American residential school and Yale, I believe. Um, so there, there's this. There was this history. The development of the game really happened in um, residential schools and Native American. I residential love that. Schools. So. Every one of the things that people put in your, on their list, and, and Valentina, where are you? Uh, Valentina, who's a in, summer intern here, was saying, you know, I'm not so sure if the things I put on my list are the kinds of things. The beauty about this exercise is everything that's on the list is supposed to be on the list, because everything that you've put on a list is a doorway into a deeper conversation about who we are, right? And so when I said a moment ago that, you know, it's not just that, oh, we have a white, you know, dead white men history, and now we have diversity. Right? 
the deepest American institutions, and I'm not talking about constitutional institutions, I'm talking about football, right? <laughs> Which is, you know, people care a whole lot more about football in the United States than they do about the 14th Amendment. Sadly, yes, but, but true, right? And so to understand that that institution in American life from the beginning was woven through with diversity, was formed and shaped by the, both the aspirations of people of color, but also the injustices against people of color, right? And that's part of our story. And that's a way into talking about, as my colleague at Aspen, Tom Ferry, talks about the way that sport shapes our idea of society, the way that our, that our narratives uh, about American civic life are drawn so much from sport and competition and horse race and, you know, uh, wipe the other side off the field and whatever it might be, right? And all these forms. And so if you think about this, I'm the child of immigrants. My parents were born in China, went to Taiwan, came to the United States from there. And I often think about as a second generation American, how many things I take for granted that they had to figure out, right? Pop Warner football is one of them. I grew up understanding what Pop Warner football is. I didn't, I didn't play football, but, you know, surprising. Uh, I didn't play football, but uh, I understood what Pop Warner football was. You get into a conversation at a party or a gathering, what's football, what's Pop Warner football? I know, they didn't know. From the get-go, Child of Immigrants becomes translator for the parent. And not just translator of the term, but translator of this little piece of cultural literacy becomes a little iota of power for you. Because then, Dad, the next time you're at IBM and you're talking to your colleagues there and they're talking about their kids in Pop Warner football, you know what they're talking about, right? And these tiny little aggregations of power and the claiming of language and the claiming of the larger, more expanded story of us is what this is meant to do. Okay, let's hear some others. Someone else who found something intriguing about a list uh, that one of your table mates shared. Yes, right here. <clears throat> Mike is coming. And tell us your name and where you are. Hi, everyone. I'm David from Los Angeles. Um, we found at our table particularly interesting um, my new friend Melanie's perspective that every American should learn about a deep study of leadership as a responsibility versus a crown you wear. Mm -hmm. And I think for all of us that resonated and I think cuts across so many of the themes we're talking about at Aspen. So that wow. was great. Yeah. Fantastic. David, and tell me your name again. Melanie. Melanie. So Melanie, why, why was that on your list? What, what made it feel like a top 10 importance thing to you? Well, I mean, I think a lot about leadership as a leader in the American South in Alabama. Um, and I find that we did this study or this deep dive in the, the Ascend Fellowship around um, Maya Angelou's brave and startling truth. And I sort of unearthed that my brave and startling truth um, is that I am fighting for my own humanity by mm. fighting for humanity in others. Mm. And so the way I show up and the way I lead um, is it's heavy and it's not a crown, it's a responsibility. And I think too often we think of leadership as a title, mm. which then also precludes people from, if you don't have that title, from feeling like you are able to lead. Yes. And I do not believe that only one or a few people are chosen. I believe we are all chosen to lead. I love that. Uh, wh where in the South are you from? I'm from Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. Okay, fantastic. So, you, you, yeah. <laughs> oh, Alabama <laughs> never gets clapped. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to really emphasize this, right? Uh, um, our, our colleague and friend Carol Stern of the Walton Family Foundation, um, which does a lot of work in Alabama and, and in, the, in both the Mississippi and Arkansas Delta, um, talks about how not only in the American South, but throughout the United States right now, um, we have to begin reconceiving leadership. She puts it as leadership as followership. Um, and uh, you know, if, how many of you know, here's another word, name to put on your list, John Gardner. Don knows, handful of you. Know. Don, tell us who John Gardner is. Hand, hand, hand Don a mic over there, raising his hand. R raise your hand. Okay. John Gardner was the founder of Common Cause, uh, a, a kind of a civic advocacy organization. He was a cabinet secretary uh, during the Nixon years. He was the creator of a whole host of organizations of civic purpose. And he was kind of the mentor uh, to so many leaders, a generation of leaders. And he instilled in all of them a term that I bet some of you have had, which is, goes to exactly what Melanie's talking about, the term servant leadership. A leader not as somebody who wears the crown, but who leads to serve, right? Servant leadership is a thing every American should know, 
right? You might want to put that in. In our work at Citizen University, we actually avoid the word leader. We talk about people as being civic catalysts. Because not everybody wears the, the mantle, the title, the crown, has the formal authority, but everybody can be a catalyst of action, of awakening, of change, of reform, right? And some of us will do that from positions of formal power and some not. Uh, but I love that that's uh, on your list. And I love already that our first two examples, uh, people are talking about my new friend, my new friend, Melanie. Um, and I, I, I love that because, you know, those of you who've been part of the Aspen Institute family for a while know that uh, Walter Isaacson wrote a wonderful biography of Benjamin Franklin, right? And there's something very Franklin-esque about the, about the challenge we face right now as Americans. Not only what he uttered when he left the Constitutional Convention and a passerby asked him, what have you all come up with here? And he answered, what did he answer? Say it. A republic if you can keep it. A republic if you can keep it. That's what he told the passerby. She asked, what did you all come up with at the convention? He said, a republic if you can keep it. Add that to your lists, right? And that Franklin has spirit of what does it mean to keep a republic? It means not just saying, oh, I'm going to outsource the responsibility of civic life and democracy to a few people, maybe a president, maybe a, you know, a governor, but I'm a, re I'm a responsible catalyst. I'm a leader from where I sit. From every chair in the orchestra, I can lead and create this music, right? And I think that Franklin S. spirit is a big part of what you're expressing. And it's, you know, and I think the other thing about having you say this from Birmingham and, and kind of describe it, you introduce yourself as a person from the American South is a very good example of the kind of flattening that happens right now. Here we are, two days after Dobbs, right? Here we are in this moment of great political division. And it'd be really easy to say, oh, person from Birmingham, from the South, got you in a box, right? I, I bet you don't know what, <laughs> I, I bet there's no box that can contain Melanie, right? I don't know, I'm not gonna assume. But I think the way that we flatten people based on where we're from, based on the accent that we hear um, in their voices, whether it's an accent that's regional or the accent of my parents' broken English, is the set of assumptions that we're trying to break down and demetabolize here in these kinds of conversations. So let's hear some others, things that you heard um, and learned or were intrigued by uh, in a list of one of your table mates uh, right here. <clears throat> I'm Loretta McCarthy, I'm from New York, but I, my friend, Harnorg, had the very simple concept that all Americans must know about geography, mm. and I'm gonna ask him to explain why that's important. <coughs> Thanks, Loretta. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, understanding just geopolitical tensions and, and the things that make each of us who we are requires us to understand where we're coming from and, and geographically where things are. I would say that um, folks in my generation, even generations below me, don't have a great understanding of world geography. Many folks, um, you know, you take the New York Times quiz, if you were to outline Ukraine, it might be hard for some folks in our generation to even identify that. So I think that's a critical piece to understanding the other, is understanding where all others come from. I love that. That's so um, powerful. And I think one of, we were talking at, uh, at this table over here with uh, Bill and, and my new friend Michael um, uh, about how as you were making your lists, some of you put topics or categories like geography or world geography. Others of you were noting events like the Stonewall uh, uh, you know, uh, uprising. Uh, others of you were talking about uh, things that maybe you could call an event, but you would say is a moment. Uh, uh, and you know, v Valentina had put on her list uh, the 2008 financial crisis and housing crisis, right? And why? Why do you put certain things, right? And I think this question of why Harnor just explained, well, the reason why is that in many ways, uh, geography can be destiny, right? Certainly when you look geopolitically uh, and you look at the fact that, um, you know, there, there is a reason why Eastern Ukraine is such vital territory. There's a reason why these parts of Ukraine that have warm water ports, that have access to other things are so valuable for Putin, right? It isn't just uh, that they like doing that. And there are reasons why people in the United States who are from landlocked states. Think about identity uh, and think about belonging connection that might be different from those of us who are either from coastal states or island states, right? Uh, and the ways in which geography shapes our notion of us and usness, that's a category idea. Uh, but, um, you know, one of the things that you were saying, and I just want to kind of, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, there was this thing, Michael, that you were saying should be uh, a thing on the list uh, to tell everybody. 
It seems to me that most Americans don't fully comprehend what socialism, or at least social democracy, means. And, it, and, and there's a knee-jerk reaction against or possibly for. And I don't think that we really uh, understand what uh, highly advanced societies in, in Scandinavia are able to accomplish uh, for the collective good. I love that. So again, the thing about every item on the list and unpacking why it is that people put it on the list is that it unspools not only a thing that you think is important that people can know, but it unspools our capacity for curiosity, right? And one of the things that we've learned in the last few years doing this work and this project is that actually it's super important and kind of, I don't know, as I was walking around the room and seeing you, like you were all smiling as you were talking to each other. You were all kind of leaning in and making you know, some connections that weren't just about the content of your list, but maybe learning about each other from different parts uh, of the United States or beyond. And that relational dimension of this is one of the things that I want to name fundamentally and put at the center. The thing that every American should know, look, if this was just a matter of textbooks, if this was just a matter of information availability, we would have this problem solved. Right? The problem is a problem of will and motivation. We don't want to learn about each other. We don't want to learn about parts of the country we don't know. We don't want to learn about the things that might destabilize our talking points. Right? I know what I mean when I say we're going down the hell, road to hell and socialism if we do this. And don't you dare question what I mean by socialism because I'm not really sure I know what I mean by socialism, right? And we don't go there. And I think it's really scary to go there among, a stra among strangers, and it's really scary to go there in a situation, it's not just cancel culture, in a situation in these fraught political times where admitting your absolute ignorance of something or admitting your partial knowledge of something feels like you're sticking your neck out and asking someone to chop it off. And the ways in which this sense of common identity and common cause, and by the way, I'm not talking consensus, right? I might, I might disagree with you and might say, you know what, I don't think geography is all that important. I think there are other things that are far more foundational. Geography is on my you know, 11 through 20 list, or I might say that you know, the, the, the thing that was one of the things on my list uh, that many of you probably wouldn't care about, Wong Kim Ark. Anybody know who Wong Kim Ark is? Wong Kim Ark is the person for whom the 1890 Supreme Court case, Wong Kim Ark versus United States, was named. He was a Chinese, uh, he was the son of Chinese immigrants in, in the 1800s, born in San Francisco, grew up during the years of the Chinese Exclusion Act. I, I don't assume that everybody in this room even knows the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? A period of time from 1882 all the way through the Second World War, when we realized, oh shoot, China's our ally, we should probably take this thing off our books, right? In which, the Chi in which people of Chinese descent were banned from the territory. The first and only time that a people were banned from emigrating and staying here on the basis of race. And Wong Kim Ark took a trip to China, and then he tried to visit family, and he came back to the United States, and at the port of San Francisco, they stopped him, and they said, you can't come in, you're Chinese. And he said, I, no, I, was, I was born here. I was born in the United States. The 14th Amendment of the Constitution says, Section 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States shall be citizens of the United States. And that language resonates to us, to our modern ears in this incredibly inclusive way. Right? But people at the time thought, well, did they only write that language for the, for the formerly enslaved? That people who were enslaved and now liberated uh, during Reconstruction that were saying that if you were born here, you're a citizen? Well, yes, that was a lot of the motivation, but if you actually know your history, you know that when Congress debated the 14th Amendment and debated that language, all persons born or naturalized in the United States shall be citizens of the United States, they talked about, people raised their hands and Congress said, does that include Mongoloids? The Mongols are gonna be citizens now too if they were born in San Francisco? And people said, yeah, exactly, and people said, yes, it does. So Congress knew what it was doing. They knew that by putting that language in and not restricting it only to the once enslaved, that they were opening the door to the children of immigrants claiming birthright citizenship. If you're born here, you're a citizen here, right? That'd be on my top 10 list, but it might, be, might not be on your top 10 list because 
you're thinking, you know what, we talk too much about immigrants. We need to talk more about something else. We talk too much about something. And the thing that I want to say here is that these habits of not just three-dimensionalizing each other and opening up these conversations with curiosity and creating the possibility of bonds of trust, maybe even uh, civic friendship uh, to be forming here, that what happens when we do this is that we remember how to create a community and we remember how to sustain a sense of pluralism. And this is the word that is, you know, <laughs> like socialism. You know, everybody has a different idea of what pluralism. I'm all for pluralism to the extent that it means we should have more diversity and more underrepresented groups in the room. But I'm not for pluralism if it means I, as a good left-leaning person in, in good standing, have to listen to someone who's celebrating the Dobbs decision yesterday. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear somebody talk about how they think all lives matter when I'm talking about black lives matter. I don't want to hear that, right? If you believe in pluralism, you believe in pluralism not, you know, what did John F. Kennedy say when he said we were going to send a man to the moon? We do this not because it is easy, but because it is hard, right? Pluralism matters not when it's easy, but when it's hard when we are confronted with the people who challenge not only our worldview, but our very sense of what's important. And again, had we done this in a frontal direct way to say, let's talk to each other about stuff that we're gonna fight about, the conversation would probably have gone less productively. But this invitation here opens up a different channel in. Now I wanna pick up on what Michael said earlier about socialism because it goes to another layer. One of the things that we've learned in this work over the last few years is that it's, it's incredibly enlightening and exciting to learn about each other's lists, to hear about what people think is important, to kind of just enrich our own minds and sense of America, past, present, and future. And doing so cannot be simply a matter of a collection of facts. We're not just kind of holding a box here and say, hey, who's got 10 facts to put in my fact box, right? Do you have 10 facts I can put here? I'd like to expand my collection of facts like it's my baseball card collection or something, right? Uh, what we're getting to when we put these facts on the table, whether it's the fact of Stonewall or the fact of uh, charges of socialism or the fact of uh, geography, is we're going to a deeper layer of the question, not of what every American should know, but why? Why? I'm working on a book right now that is kind of inspired by this project um, on what an American should know. And as I'm doing this book, I've come to really realize that the kind of round one of our work on this has been super informative and exciting to see the ways in which it catalyzes community and connection the way it's done just in the last 50 minutes here in this room. But I think we can't stop there, right? Because we're in a moment right now, for reasons good and bad, in ways that are hopeful and scary, uh, we are in a moment of great civic imagination. Let me put it that way, right? People are imagining alternatives to capitalism. People are imagining alternatives to shareholder primacy as the flag under which all capitalism must kind of, uh, you know, bow, right? People are challenging that, and that's a wonderful moment of civic imagination if you happen to be of that point of view. At the same time, people are imagining you can overturn an election. You can have a vice president just have an alternate slate of electors, right? Whatever else you want to say about the plot of January 6th and the conspiracy behind January 6th, you, you must acknowledge it is an act of civic imagination. Those folks were thinking outside the box, right? And I say this in a way that is actually meant to both, uh, to elicit just these chuckles. Imagination alone is insufficient. A lot of people are imagining how to burn it down how to tear it down, how to do something new. And not all the things that are being imagined right now are things that all of us would welcome. And so we come pretty quickly when we put our facts in a box to those questions of prior purpose. What are we doing here together? What is the aim of this enterprise? The, the operating question of all Chicago public school civics classes is how shall we live together? Right? And so I now want to open up for a conversation as, you know, I see Mia and David's hands already going up about these questions of why, uh, that, what's stirring in you um, when we open the aperture this way? And uh, yeah, let's give the, and introduce yourself, Mia. I'm Mia Birdsong. Um, I'm an Ascend Fellow. Um, 
I know you'll have an answer for this question, Eric, so this is why I'm gonna ask it. So part of what we've been talking about is um, adding to this like box of facts. Um, I think we're, we're obviously at a moment where like, that's one thing to be like, here's a fact and like, how do we feel about this thing? Mm -hmm. Versus here's a fact and I don't actually, that's like not actually a fact. Um, so the idea that the 2016 or the 2020 election was stolen, for example, and I know that there is, again, this is why I'm asking you this question because I know I have an answer for it. But I think there's a, it's different to say here's a fact and we're going to talk about how we feel about it versus our inability to agree upon what's facts. Yes, that's a profound question right now, and um, uh, and we'll have a, we'll come to you in a moment, uh, sir. I, I want to speak to this really briefly because I think one of the things about that has changed since we launched this project a few years ago, what every American should know, is that we have entered an epistemic crisis, <laughs> right? An ontological crisis about how does anyone know anything? We've entered an age of conspiracy thinking. We've entered an age where QAnon is as great a, an, an authority as Henry Louis Gates on American history, right? Um, and that, that is also an act of civic imagination. The internet is gonna democratize knowledge, great, right? <laughs> And so every fact itself can be contested. And I don't have, a, I don't have an answer, Mia, uh, but, I, but here's what I do have. And this gets to the thing that we've come to in the second round of work on this project. I have more questions. And I think this is the thing that we've all got to equip ourselves with right now. When Michael asked, what is socialism? He's opening up a, an inquiry. He's opening up a dialogue, right? And the thing is, if I'm in a conversation with, and there are people I know, there are people that by marriage I'm related to, who believe the 2020 election was stolen, who believe the current president is illegitimate, right? I, the only way we're going to enter into some form of engagement that doesn't end up with scorched earth or broken stuff is for him in the first place is for us to feel, each to the other, that we're not there to destroy one another, that we're not there to humiliate the other, and that we're not there to make the other feel like an idiot. That, that's hard for me in this moment with this, you know, with this person, um, because the facts are so obvious, and this person's adherence to non-fact is so dangerous, right? But Jonathan Rausch has a wonderful book came out last year called The Constitution of Knowledge that is not talking about the United States Constitution or a, a, a legal constitution, but about the ways in which in a million-fold mutual agreement, we agree on ways that certain things are real and certain things are not. Scientists have been doing this for a long time and they call it the scientific method. But we, you know, when you get to a ten, top 10 list like this, how do any of us know anything? How do I really know about the Wong Kim Ark story? Right? I read about it somewhere. I didn't interview descendants of Wong Kim Ark. I didn't look at his papers. I didn't get firsthand knowledge. All knowledge right now is networked and second or third or fourth hand. And so the only way I'm going to move someone off false knowledge in that way is if we activate a countervailing network and web of relationship and trust where that person can actually over time come to realize, hey, I'm not out to own him, I'm not out to humiliate him, I don't look down on him as a coastal elite. I'm there to learn. And I'm not gonna like coddle him or make him feel like he's special because he's wrong, right? But I am gonna build that foundation layer of trust and relationship out of which we're gonna have a conversation about, come on, man, come on. You know, and at the end of that, still, come on, man, he may not move off those facts, or the, um, off his, his belief, right? But it's the, this is why I say I don't have an answer. I have only a pathway, which is more questions. Why do you believe that, right? And this is, I think, when I said earlier that curiosity is one of the greatest civic virtues we have to reanimate right now, what, don't, don't destroy this guy for believing a dangerous falsehood. Ask why. What is it in your sense of identity, your fear, your loss, your shame, whatever, your pride, that leads you to grab onto this lattice work of lies? 
right? And we have another project in my Aspen program called the Better Arguments Project on the idea that it's okay to have arguments in American life. You know, we, just, we don't need fewer arguments, we just need less stupid ones, right? And less stupid argument means an argument that in part is one in which you take winning off the table. It's amazing to see what happens when you engage with somebody not to win the debate, but just to understand where they're coming from, right? And I think that opens up a shift. Okay, we've got a few other hands that have come up. And what we're gonna do here is, if it's a question or a comment, I'm gonna just hear them all in sequence, and then um, in the remaining time, I'm gonna try to kind of uh, s synthesize here. But uh, uh, we've heard from you a moment ago, so I wanna ask a, a hand. Um, uh, two hands here, one hand, uh, and two hands there. And then, yes, you first, yeah, because you called earlier. Uh, thank you. First off, I think this is, this is just an enormously rich conversation, so thank you. It strikes me, it, my name's Jason Gray. I work in, uh, I'm from North Carolina, and I've had a career working in rural development, primarily in the South. Uh, I've worked a lot with an Aspen policy program, in fact. Uh, it strikes me it's important about what we, what we know, share, what we shared knowledge, but also shared experiences. Yes. And I just want to give two examples, one of which builds on what you, you sort of alluded to, which is we have a, a measurable number of people in this country who, who don't think we had a fair election in the last round. I, I would reasonably bet that 99.99999% of them have never worked as an election volunteer. So one of the shared experiences I think that is requisite of citizenship is that we should work Yes. In, in elections. Yes. The second I would add, and, and there's a lot of other experiences we could add, but I just want to give another one because it's very personal to me. Okay, I, I grew up in Yorktown, Virginia, where the Revolutionary War ended. I have a pretty deep sense of American history. I understand it. And five or six years ago, I, I hired as an intern a graduate student who came from Ghana, Africa. His parents had been in the country for a while. He had come here for graduate school. I hired him. And he became a naturalized citizen. And I thought I knew what it was like to be an American, but I was wrong, and I didn't know until I attended that naturalization ceremony. Thank you. So, just two examples. Just experiential experiences. Absolutely, together. and it is the doing of stuff together and the experiencing of things together that helps find that. Okay, we had, we had two hands here. Um, uh, yeah, you've got the mic next. Hi, um, I'm Chloe Valdery, live in, New, live in New York from New Orleans. Um, I just wanted to comment that the r curiosity, the word curiosity, comes from the root word cura, which means to care. That's, that's what it actually means, to show curiosity towards someone or some idea is to care for that person. And I just want to echo your point about not bashing the person who believes, who, you know, January 6th and all of these things, because it is precisely the absence of care or precisely the absence of feeling cared for that led that person to believe what they're believing in the first place. And so if you reinforce that, you will actually be contributing to something that you don't want to contribute to in the first place. Uh, Chloe, thank you so much for that. And um, we're gonna get to hear more from Chloe and me. Uh, we're doing a session together this afternoon uh, back here on trust, but I, I, I wanna connect a dot between what uh, um, uh, Jason just said and Chloe, which is, you know, one of the things that Jonathan Rauch said in that book, The Constitution of Knowledge, is that the only way you move people off these delusions or conspiracy theories or whatever is to recognize that a large percentage, not 99%, but a large percentage of the beliefs that people hold right now on things that are most polarizing are not because they've thought about it or experienced it and therefore have come to a judgment about the thing, but it's because their tribe or their team believes it, right? Their tribe or their team believes it. And so if your tribe or your team believes X, it feels socially costly to not believe X, right? And I think, and that is as true on the left as it is on the right. It is socially costly on the left to ask, hey, have DEI programs in corporate America actually like done a thing? Are, are they, is, is that the way to do, you know, is that, no, what, are you against social justice, racial justice, right? No one wants to go to these places and I think the, Again, the conceit of this top 10 list is one way in which we can actually invite people to be themselves in the sense of peel off from just what your team, your tribe, your group, your cohort says right now that you're supposed to think 
and believe. Uh, okay, we had a couple um, uh, other hands real quickly, and then we're going to wrap. Hi, I'm Manju uh, from Los Angeles. So I appreciate what you're saying, Eric, in terms of the need for dialogue and conversation. But the, the challenge I'm having is, what if the other person or people actually believes and is working to um, essentially diminish my rights or eliminate my rights? So if the other belie person believes in voter suppression and thinks you, sh you, Manju, should not be able to vote as a naturalized citizen, then we're not on, this is not a dialogue anymore, right? They are actually working to prevent my citizenry, right, citizenship, mm. and the rights that I believe I should have. So Manju, um, by the way, is one of the uh, leaders right now in the United States around uh, pushing back against um, uh, anti-Asian hate um, and activating and organizing not just people in the AAPI community, but allies and others uh, to build power, countervailing power, right? And I think that is one of the things right now. So I guess what I, I guess I partially would challenge the premise, even if that, even if you encounter the per. Look, let me say in the first, like, time is finite. So in terms of the relationships and the dialogue you want to go, maybe you don't go to the hardest case first, right? I'm not going to do this with the avowed white nationalist, you know, person who ha hates all uh, people of Asian descent. Um, but if you get to somebody who is you know, well short of that, there are plenty of folks right now in the modern Republican Party who are like, let's repeal birthright citizenship. It's becoming a thing now. Wong Kim Ark, let's scrap that decision, right? Um, there are too many what they call anchor babies, you know, in the United States. And America is for Americans, by which they mean a certain picture of Americans, right? So that's real. And if I were engaged with someone like that, I would say that, yes, you are engaged in two things at once. One is a conflict of civic power. They don't want you or me to claim United States citizenship, and we intend to, right? But what you're also engaged with them is a dialogue. You actually are navigating and negotiating with them continuously. And at a minimum, even if all you're going to do is, I got to beat that guy in politics. <laughs> I got to make sure that the virus of this person's worldview gets contained and does not spread throughout the rest of the party or throughout the rest of our polity, even if only for that reason, you've got to understand with care and curiosity and full humanity, why it is that they've come to that worldview? Most people are not born waking up saying, I want to restrict birthright citizenship. Most people come to that particular policy point of view because, again, culture precedes structure, because something in their <laughs> vision of self, their story of self, their story of us, their story of who we are right now, their pain and their experience, as Jason said, has led them to this point where that is one piece of a platform that gives them identity, belonging, pride, and a sense of purpose. And plenty of people in the United States, and this is only going to get worse, and when Barb was talking this morning about the precursors to civil war, it's not just tribalism, it's not just that our institutions are breaking down, it's when people find their identity and their purpose in the othering of other people and in the demonization and the kind of putting down zero sum of other people. I'm going to put them down so that I can go up. I think it's an open question whether we who are gathered here today are going to be enough. I don't come here as some Pollyanna optimist like, we're going to fix it, don't worry, right? The kinds of people who come to the Aspen Ideas Festival, like that's all America needs. I don't know. I don't know. But this is why I want to close on this note. I never say that I'm optimistic about American democracy and American civic life. I say I am hopeful. Because optimism is a spectator's posture. I'm optimistic the Yankees are going to win the World Series this year. They're actually quite on track to do it this year. But, but I have nothing to do with whether they do or not. I will have no hand in whether they win the World Series. Hope, by contrast, implies agency. Hope implies that I have something to do with the outcome, right? And I wanted to leave you with this thought that when we ask each other, what should every American know? When we ask each other, who is us? When we ask each other, what is democracy for? Who are the people? When you get to that, the second round I was talking about of these why questions, why is democracy a thing worth preserving? When we say democracy, do we mean majority rule? Why is majority rule between two choices the right thing? 
When we start peeling the onion of these questions, we start taking more responsibility for the answers. And I think this work of recognizing that we have agency and we have power in the not rebuilding, not restoration of our democracy, but the achievement of our democracy, right? This is a case of first impression. As Yasha Monk was saying in his session with Barbara uh, today, no society. We're doing something that no society on planet Earth has tried to do before, to create a mass, multiracial, multi-faith democratic republic that lasts for more than one or two rounds. Hasn't been done. No society has hit all of those marks. And we're trying to. And when we gather in conversations like this, when you take those sheets home with you and you have a conversation with somebody back in your hometown, back in your organization, back in your gardening club, back in your workplace, back in your whatever it might be, your club, and you say, let's have a conversation about this. I thought this was a pretty interesting way. And you start opening up not only that curiosity, but that responsibility taking. Like I said, I don't know if that's going to be enough, but I will say it's going to be absolutely necessary for us to show up that way for each other and with each other. I want to thank you all today for showing up and staying long for this session. <clears throat>